Welcome, one and all. I will give us a little bit of time because I know um, folks will be kind of tuning in, taking taking time to populate here. So I will just sit and talk to myself. Normally, I have a guest. It's so much lonelier streaming alone. Definitely give shout outs to the folks that do this as a career and are used to kind of being solo and just hey, you engage with the chat and stuff that's kind of the main the main vibe for everybody but yeah welcome uh to this is normally the kudo musicology ludo musicology literature review show <laughs> and i'm your host musicologist um most weeks we have a guest on and we highlight uh works of scholarship in, in the growing field of ludomusicology, video game music studies. Um, and I have the authors on, we discuss the process of publication, and um, we kind of summarize the article, we play musical examples, and just sort of highlight the good work in the field and make it more, more accessible outside of academia. But today, I wanted to change gears and offer the second version uh, of a workshop that I gave two years ago, last year, all time is lost in the pandemic. Um, the workshop on much better abstract tactics, also known as Wombat, and Pete Smucker coined that term and it was adorable, so we stuck with it. So I am your Wombat leader. <laughs> and uh, the idea here is um, in even in academia, there's so much unspoken training that happens <laughs> like there's there's so little um time devoted to teaching even graduate students how do you write an abstract um that you are planning to submit to to a conference um or even to a publication you know for potential publication like how, what do you what do you what types of things need to be included the word counts are usually quite small and and it's just a, a different style of writing to kind of fit everything in, in a good way. Um, and so sometimes if you have a very active advisor, you might have somebody that takes you, takes you aside or um, asks to see your, your abstracts and might give you some advice as you're going through. But for a lot of us, it's a lot of trial and error. So you just start kind of sending things off and then maybe you get a bunch of rejections and eventually you kind of find your way to a process that works and it doesn't mean it's foolproof it doesn't mean that like once you learn the secret every single abstract will get in but um it's because we so so rarely have anything like this where we actually talk about what types of things we might want to include um so my thought is this can be a useful research resource for graduate students for folks maybe that are trained scholars but are new to our specific little subfield of ludomusicology. Um, so this is particularly being offered uh, in advance of the October 15th deadline for the North American Conference on Video Game Music, or NACVGUM, as we so lovingly acronym it. Um, and so with that coming up, I wanted to re-offer this session that I, that I've given in the past and just kind of walk us through what makes a good abstract and all that. So a lot of you know me <laughs> and, and all that, but in case you don't, um, in case you found your way here from a recommendation from someone else, um, uh, just a brief introduction to myself. I'm Dana Plank or musicologist online. I have a PhD in historical musicology with concentrations in ludomusicology and disability studies. I work a lot in identity, um, gender, sexuality, and disability in particular. And I served on the board and as co-chair of the ludomusicology and the music and media study groups in the American Musicological Society. Um, the study groups are allotted sessions at the annual meetings. So I was in charge of coming up with ideas for sessions and working with the other officers to send out calls for papers, review abstracts, curate the session, send all relevant info back to AMS for scheduling and things like that. The study groups are a really great way to get involved um, if you are newer to the field as well. It's, it's kind of a nice stepping stone for, for someone to get more involved in some of the 
you know, AMS proper or um, some of these, these other conferences. I'm also on the board for the North American Conference on Video Game Music, which we, again, call NACFAGUM, lovingly, <laughs> where I have served on the program committee for several years now, and we evaluate dozens of abstracts each year for, for our annual conference. I am also a co-chair of the Game Studies track of Game Sound Con, which is an industry-facing conference where Matthew Thompson and I attempt to bring scholarship on game music into conversation with game audio professionals and foster connections between academics and the industry. And I am a peer reviewer for the Journal of Sound and Music and Games, where I've served to provide feedback to those seeking to publish their work. So it's much further than the abstract phase usually. Um, often they've presented at a conference and now they're trying to publish it in a journal because a lot of us use conference uh, presentations as a way to kind of refine and hone things we plan to publish. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you. Attempt. Yeah, I do my best. <laughs> um, so yeah, I provide feedback. I, I try to think carefully about carefully about how I word criticism in that space. I, I try to view my role as inherently constructive and promote rigor while hopefully empowering the author to make the work the best it can be before it goes to print. So I don't want anyone, even if I'm saying, I, you know, I think something needs work before it goes to publication. I, I hope it never comes across as like the, the reviewer to cliche of just being, you know, kind of ad hominem, <laughs> like cruel, saying this stuff isn't publishable. I want it to always be very constructive and very actionable. So I think really carefully in all of these spaces about uh, cultivating relationships and rigor. And then on the side of all of this, uh, one of my many side gigs, because I am contingently employed as an adjunct, uh, so I have to fill in, and I am a, a gigging violinist um, and freelance, you know, music transcriber and arranger for any size of ensemble. Um, but another way that I make some income is that I'm a freelance editor for academic dissertations and theses, where I line edit, copy edit, proofread, format, everything from undergraduate papers to manuscripts by PhDs. So I advise clients on how to improve argumentation, structure, and flow, in addition to helping catch the, obje the more objective errors. And I've worked on dozens, <laughs> many, many, many abstracts since I began the job in 2016, because some people do engage that service for abstracts. So with all this said, uh, I have a kind of an insider view into some of the major venues where you might be looking to present your work and having served on several of these program committees. And I've started to do a lot of thinking about articulating what it is I look for in an abstract. So in the end, this is my advice. Other members of the program committees may have different criteria or things that are important to them. Hopefully some of them are here and can kind of speak to um, what sorts of things they look for, what, what they might prioritize as most important. So I'll try to speak to my experiences and the kinds of things I've seen others say when evaluating abstracts. And then another caveat, but one that is probably very important, maybe the most important to note, is that sometimes the rejections have nothing to do with the quality of your abstract. You know, crafting a compelling program involves so much more than merely, merely tallying rankings and taking top scoring proposals. That is a component of many groups. But um, two years ago, I think it was, um, we ended up taking like standard deviations of scores, find out which ones we disagreed on the most. Pete Smucker kind of held that up, headed that up and um, it allowed for really interesting conversation and we ended up discussing a swath of abstracts that were kind of in that middle ground or on the cusp and then then we kind of looked at the merits of different proposals and then you know considered how they might pair with other papers we plan to accept and what would make the best fit given the finite number of slots on the program so sometimes you just get unlucky where your work kind of just is so unique that it, there's there's nothing to really put it with. <laughs> um, and the, this this can be a reason that maybe something doesn't get it accepted. And it doesn't mean that the, the quality isn't good or people don't want to hear about the work. They just don't have a spot for it. So there are papers every single year that I would love to see that we're unable to accept. And I always hope those folks resubmit the work elsewhere or, you know, reach out and, um, you know, get get advice from those of us in the field, because I think a lot of folks are happy to happy to say like what they'd like to see or or know that that looks really good, it, you know, could just be a roll of the dice. So sometimes, sometimes things are not are 
uh, not our fault in the end. <laughs> and there, there's a lot of that in academia where, yeah, some things, yeah, things are so unique that we absolutely want to accept it and find a way. Yeah, sometimes that's true too. Sometimes we, we figure it out. We have played with the idea of doing like one-off papers um, in the virtual version of the conference where we just kind of let that one paper not be in a session. <laughs> like here, just, just do this paper. Um, and not every program committee thinks that way. Um, but I, I think that we're kind of open to just creating, you know, the program that our conference attendees are going to get the most out of regardless. So yeah, we want to, we want to get the top quality work represented. Um, but I, I do like to, you know, when we know that the job market is so tough and <laughs> abstracts getting rejected is so common, um, I think it is just important to remind ourselves that uh, you can do everything right and still fail because that's kind of the nature of the field. But it's it's not necessarily uh, there's always an opportunity to reflect on the abstract and see, like, was there something that was sort of preventing my topic from coming through clearly was the topic maybe not where it needed to be and like I should do a little more work on this and try again um there it's good to go back and look at those things but also sometimes the you know the the failure is actually not a reflection of you Ludo Gonzo has entered the chat <laughs> so what is the purpose of giving a conference paper? Yes, sharing our research with peers, of course. Um, getting that new line on the CV is vital for early career scholars on a publishing clock and students. And participating in conferences helps build relationships that help you feel like you're a part of the field. And so, you know, even maybe even more so for students, I felt like there's a threshold to that I felt like I had to cross where... Um, I almost felt like some folks didn't even want to talk to me or engage with me at like the bigger conferences until they'd sort of seen work from me. Um, and they're there to, you know, work on their, their own relationships, their own networks. And, and so there is kind of a, a threshold and I'm not saying that everybody is super exclusive or anything, but, um, I did feel like once I had kind of given a conference paper or two and people kind of got to know my work, it, it sort of opened up avenues um, and relationships with certain scholars. So as soon as I gave a couple papers, again, it just gave us common ground instead of just me kind of going up to the senior scholar and praising them or asking for very generic academic advice. You know, it kind of gave us a talking point where we could kind of engage with the work itself. And, and then I was able to grow from that. So of course, those seeking um, tenure track employment, those in, and those preparing for tenure also really need to keep active in the field and try to balance their curriculum vitae and make sure that they're steadily adding lines under teaching, publications, service, conference publications, or conference presentations. You, know, they, you have to have a, a balance. In a lot of schools, it's pretty rigorous. So uh, there's a lot of competition. And I feel like once folks get tenure, they're able to kind of breathe and slow down a little bit <laughs> and, you know, take a little more time letting things percolate. But I think there we are often in the younger uh, eras of the field often encouraged to just like just be constantly productive and put work out there but ultimately a conference paper you know beyond all of the the kind of personal gain of like oh I have a line on the CV it's going to look good for applying for jobs or you know good to go in my tenure portfolio a lot of academics ultimately use it to test drive material for eventual publication so fielding questions and receiving feedback to help help take the work in new directions before it goes off to the anonymous peer review. And I think taking these conversations to heart, both in the Q&A and, and any conversations you have kind of between sessions with folks, it's a good way to mitigate that soul-crushing comment of the infamous reviewer too. So it can turn a potential rejection into a revise and resubmit or even an accept with changes, which helps speed up the glacial publication process a bit. And fielding the Q&A lets you know things that you might have missed or that complement your work nicely, especially with regard to academic literature, because n none of us can read everything, no matter how thorough we try to be, and that's okay. And this is why we crowdsource our friends and folks we look up to into the field. Um, it, can, it can help us, you know, just figure out a new, new place to take the work, um, new ways to explore. So I, I always say... Um, it's, it's about helping refine what you have and use, use your smart friends to do it. So when folks give, give a paper, especially more than once, and it comes out in print in basically the same form it was originally given, 
I always say I am sus. I had to have my Among Us. <laughs> it's very sus. Like, because at the end of the day, that that just seems very a very lonely way to go about scholarship to me. I think you, I think you need we need each other, and uh, the work improves if we really are building those relationships and also being able to build our scholarship off of what everybody is contributing to that experience. And uh, I love when I, when I see a publication and like the first footnote, you know, they, they, they give all these thanks to, you know, somebody said this thing at, at, a, at the Q and a, when I gave the paper at NACVGUM and it, like it, it really, really helped shape stuff. Um, I love seeing that. I love seeing the process of it and just how it can introduce all these new areas and, I don't know, just leads to it leads to more strength overall. So I think going in with a charitable charitable spirit is really helpful. You know, it's like I that I, that idea of I want my work to be its best. <laughs> and I'm classically trained as a as a musician, so I remember thinking um the relationship to criticism in a performance space and how for some people that doesn't always translate over to transitioning into being a scholar. But I remember in classical training, you, you think of sitting through critiques, um, juries, um, studio classes, um, chamber music, you know, workshops, master classes, and, and how you do have to sort of get a thick skin, learn how to take criticism and how to implement it to improve oneself and then some of those same people do fine in that setting. <laughs> some people don't. Some people really struggle with it there, too. But um, some of those same folks then move over to academic work. Because most of us uh, train, you know, in, in some sort of an instrument first um, and then decide we want to go into the more academic side of music. And then suddenly there's like a new vulnerability that opens up with putting our work out there and... Uh, so uh, suddenly folks that maybe were used to taking that type of criticism to improve their playing, it can feel, again, just very personal to have have one's writing or their style come into question um, or just, just have somebody disagree and recognize, like, even an editor isn't necessarily um, the end-all be-all. You don't necessarily have to make every single change, you know. There's a process of learning how to implement the feedback and to improve but also preserve your voice a little bit. So that there's a growing process there too. So all of this is to say that the uh, the conference process is a nice way to get used to fielding those types of things that people bring up because you will absolutely get people making comments that are kind of irrelevant or oh have you played this game and it's you know just not not in the scope of what you're working on like. But sometimes they bring up stuff that is really valuable and useful and you think, oh, then I then I go explore that and I missed it and I really would like to incorporate it in some way and it can reshape the work. So um, it can be very vulnerable. But I, I, I always think of these, pub these conference presentations as a way for my peers to sort of help me smooth the work over before non-Ludo colleagues see it. And, you know, the worst thing would be for everybody to just kind of go along with it and be like oh yeah that's fine that's fine and then you publish it and and it's just it, you know it's making you look bad it's making the field look bad um and then these scholars are getting a negative impression of the you know the level of your your work we we don't want that happening uh, we want to promote the rigor and impress everyone else like it's it's not really about uh the field proving itself um, but a good article or chapter will always speak for itself. It'll get cited a lot. Um, it'll, it'll be a catalyst to future work in your own career. And um, it can also, at its best, um, it can legitimize what we do. And for anyone who harbors misconceptions about video games as children's medium or as like a cheap entertainment devoid of artistic value, you know, a really good public rigorous publication on, on game music can really open somebody's eyes to that. And we're slowly getting more and more of those people on our side <laughs> where they, they don't think that. But there are still people out, out there that, that think that, you know, maybe we need to stick to more like absolute music, right? Uh, that, that old issue. So promoting rig rigor can be intense. But I think um, the NACVGM program committee or my stream team that uh, streams on most Thursday evenings, you know, and or GameSoundCon, any of these things I've been involved with, um, 
I can kind of speak for a lot of them and say that there's a hope that we can build community and make this an inclusive space so critique can come from colleagues who care about you and you can become an even stronger member of the broader academic community. All right. So that, that's like my little soapbox about <laughs> academia and connection and <laughs> conference papers turning into publications and kind of stuff about the field in general. Let's get, let's get down to brass tacks. What are, what, what are abstracts? What kinds are there? Um, Cause there are multiple kinds. Um, and I'm just going to highlight a few that are kind of common that I, that I see most related to our work. Informative is common in the sciences and social sciences. So we don't see it as much in the humanities, at least not in its pure form. Um, an informative ab abstract gives as clearly and simply and directly as possible. Uh, it outlines the purpose, the method, the scope, the results, and the conclusion of a study. And so those are a pretty boilerplate format for a reason. And actually, even some, some science uh, dissertations in terms of how the chapters are set up are also like almost like plug and play, <laughs> like drag and drop. You know, it's like, you know, you have to have these sections, you fill them out with the specifics of your study. Um, and they're boilerplate for a reason. They're efficient. They tell the committee everything they need to make a decision about how the work fits into the session or the conference. So there's use there. <laughs> so even though we don't tend to see those in the humanities, um, like hold that thought about this idea of laying out everything, including your results. That, that's an interesting idea to hold on to. Then we have descriptive abstracts. These are like book jackets. The whole point is to entice your readers with compelling threads without giving things away, like conclusions. It includes the purpose, method, and scope and describes the study but might not present any results. So I often see this style from folks who are proposing really new research who maybe don't have a true conclusion yet and are hoping the conference acceptance will give them a reason to write said paper and find that conclusion. I also see it from students who are maybe in their head thinking like, I'll save the best stuff for the paper itself and wow us in the presentation. So I think a descriptive abstract can work. Um, again, if it's so compelling, sometimes people have to know, um, but it can also be risky um, and not as easy to pull off because it can make your work look like it's not ready to present yet. The committee might feel like, well, do they actually have anything? You know, do they like where where is the work actually sitting? How far along is it? <clears throat> um, are they going to get to the presentation and then like it didn't really go where they thought it was going to go, you know, so it, it, it feels a little more risky. So I sort of advise for a hybrid of the two, informative and descriptive. So I like to think carefully about the language and wording to sort of pique readers interest, like a descriptive abstract, that sort of compelling thread to catch us while still giving us as much information as possible to show that committee that the work is at a stage to present. So there is such thing as work that's not ready to go in up in front of your peers. So what stage does my paper need to be in to submit to a conference? Everybody's going to have a different take on this, but here's kind of my two cents. <laughs> When I was first starting out as a graduate student, I was much more secure proposing only papers I had only written, I had already written. So usually turning around a seminar paper into a conference. Um, I, I needed practice writing the abstracts at all. And abstracts are a lot easier to write when the paper already exists and you're just kind of distilling it down. It's also why um, for dissertations, usually the abstract is one of the last things you write because you kind of know at that point everything you have done. Uh, sometimes even whole introductory chapters to dissertations are actually the last thing written for the same reason. Uh, the, the outer chapters, maybe the ultimate conclusions and the, the intro and then the abstract. So it, it can be really easy um, if you're not feeling super scared to take something you already have. Absolutely. Also, if you're writing a paper for a grad school course, you've likely already had feedback on that draft or the final version from the professor that you can use to refine your paper so the presentation is more polished. So it's a little bit less risky. As you get experience in the field, though, you start developing more intuition about sort of how much initial research is enough 
for you to have a secure footing to write a proposal. And this does come a bit with with practice, having abstracts accepted or rejected. And I used to sort of marvel at the idea that my advisor would propose a paper for a conference that he hadn't even started writing. You know, like, how? How, how? <laughs> how, can, how does one do that? It's a norm I understand, but getting there took years, it took time and experience, it just attending conferences, um, and even doing a little bit of meta, like paying attention to how other people structured their abstracts in the, in the program, uh, the programs for the conferences, um, or sometimes those are online. Now you can look those up in advance. I've actually downloaded abstracts or even written on my conference programs, kind of marking them up with things I found effective, um, especially early on when I was trying to figure out, uh, so sort of cracking the code. I had a lot of rejections before I, I started getting acceptances. And when I finally got accepted, I got accepted to four different conferences in the same semester. <laughs> so when I started, I started off like right out the gate. And they were four totally different papers because I also had it in my head that I couldn't propose the same paper for multiple conferences, um, which you can do. You can absolutely, you know, put things in front of very different audiences and kind of get different feedback um, or, or use the, the first presentation to kind of grow it for the second one that that is absolutely normal and again it's part of that process of refining the work but uh, as a grad student I was like well I, I can't do that <laughs> you know it's I, I have to do new things so I had four totally different conference papers in a single semester including NACFAGUM which was my very first presentation ever and it was terrifying it was absolutely terrifying um, and I was, I, w I opened the conference that it was the first one, the first Nafigum in 2014. I was the very first 8 a.m. day one paper. Um, so that was scary. <laughs> but luckily, everybody was really nice. Um, and I, I stayed. So, and I met, I've met so many good people along the way. So, um, your paper will change. Uh, over the course of working on it. Sometimes the best stuff comes later in the process. Um, a new source might come your way and change your direction. Your analysis might reveal something unique, novel, and interesting that wasn't there before. But I say it never hurts to be more prepared um, than less until you really start to, to hone that sense of what kind of what you can get away with in terms of proposing brand new work. Um, there's not There's not like a a checklist of, you know, you need X number of sources already read in your bibliography before you can write an abstract. It, it doesn't work that way. It is it, the reason that this is so tricky is that it's subjective. So I like to tell people to, to kind of be more prepared than less initially. And that said, you maybe have more courage than me or less imposter syndrome or more faith in your work and you know be bold <laughs> the worst that can happen is your proposal isn't accepted so uh it's pretty low low stakes overall so uh, can a paper be too far along you know we can say that it's not far enough along but can it be too far along but the paper isn't written yet like you just have too much research um and I kind of say yes and no, like generally no. I think all preparation and research and analysis and whatever else you do is valuable and vital, but you may have to make some decisions about what to keep to fit into an abstract into a 20 minute presentation. So maybe you have much larger work. It's maybe part of a dissertation, part of an eventual book project. Um, and the common error when things are too far along is that the scope isn't delimited enough for it's a 20 minute conference paper. You know, we're, we're talking a couple, you know, one or maybe two like in depth case studies or, you know, it, you, you really have to think about like that time goes so quickly. And if you try to just incorporate all these discourses and oh, I have to speak to, you know, how I'm triangulating all of these literatures, uh, that's a problem I often have <laughs> in my own work. I usually am trying to bring too many things into it. So really thinking about, all right, it's a 20 minute paper. I don't have to bring everything. <laughs> I can rely on that research as my bedrock for the Q&A, but may, let's just focus on one piece of it for this abstract. So if it's really far along, then then absolutely. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the gift. Of, that's amazing. Y'all are great. <laughs> That's the coolest. I think that's the first time that we've had gifted subs on this channel. So amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah. So 
it can be, I think I like in a sense the research can be too far along for a conference paper but then it's just a matter of n- not having it be too many things um, and where this shows up in the abstract is you kind of don't have room to fit stuff you know it's really hard to speak to all the things you're trying to cram in that's usually a clue that you need to maybe look at your scope a little bit and and cut and and figure out you know, what's, maybe I'm looking at all of the themes in this game, but maybe I want to, for the paper, focus on a couple of them as representative examples, and then trust that, well, I've looked at the rest of the game, maybe people will ask me about it in the hallway or ask me during Q&A, and then I can kind of jump into all this other work that I did. So what stage does my paper need to be? We already did that. All right, components of a good abstract. Crystal clear title. I love I love a good title. So I, I say it can have cute stuff in it, like a pun on the title of the game or something play related. Um, but it, then it also needs the meat to tell you what it's about. So in a conference paper land, um, and sometimes in in publications it depends usually the cute thing the alliteration the pun comes first and then there's a colon and then there's the informative part of the title um so these these are a few of mine so my favorite one (laughs) i have kind of a cutesy one an alliterative one and then a pun one my favorite is probably the pun at the bottom taking a gander at the use of wc and untitled goose game so the gander is the cute part it's the pun there's no colon in that one but you know then it explains exactly what the paper did it you know looked at wc and untitled goose game great um you know turned on sensuality and sound in early video games haha ha. <laughs> there's like a pun there but it relates to the the general topic and then it kind of explains what it is in the second half and uh in publishing the trend is often the opposite where the inform- informative title comes first and then like any cute thing comes afterward um, but that has to do with search engine optimization for folks trying to find your work in print they they kind of want the more informative thing first so there's like the uh reaches down (laughs) the classic music in the role-playing game heroes and harmonies so like the alliterative part comes second um and that that routledge would have told them to do that first instead of heroes and harmonies music in the role-playing game so you'll see that um in the original version of this workshop i went a little long on this but i just i really like people's titles (laughs) so i won't read all of these but these are some of my favorite kind of clever titles from Nakvagum's past. (laughs) Um, You know, Kevin Burke has some really good, clever titles. Pushing the Envelope, Distinct Sound Drivers for the Common Famicom, because Envelope, of course, refers to the onset, duration, and uh, (laughs) decay of sound. So, ha! But also Pushing the Envelope is a phrase. Ha ha! So I won't explain all the jokes here, but there's a bunch here of of these examples and most of them follow again like alliteration and then explaining what the thing is right uh collaboration communication cancellation uh will gibbons ode to joysticks (laughs) and talking about the beethoven of game music love that um so most of these follow the like cutesy thing first but the important point being here that um you do want to have an informative bit to your title if it's just the cutesy thing people have no idea what it's about at the outset so it, you know it's your first impression um yeah, i have so these are more of these informative titles that don't have a cutesy thing you can do that too um that just here here's what it's called <laughs> you know you don't feel if if you don't feel like uh you have anything that comes naturally that feels like clever and uh, fun, then absolutely don't don't force it. <laughs> I, it. It's fine to just have it be like, here's the thing, levels of reality and artifice in the talus principle. That's great. Uh, it works really well. And then again, if you think of these things as kind of stepping stones to publication, you can absolutely then take them and turn them into um, something that has like that grabby title or subtitle later on. Um, but there's nothing wrong with, with having it be very straightforward when in doubt drop the cute thing and have the 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 informative part so many good ones yeah i I pulled so many (laughs) all right so the components themselves we have an introduction 
We have a thesis statement or some kind of a statement of problem or purpose. We have methods, results, conclusions, central arguments, examples, maybe one. <laughs> As, uh, this will determine, depend on how much space you have. Um, and then we'll talk about some of these other elements. So in general, I do like to uh, introduction or thesis statement. This is where, you know, um, this uh, this is very much going to be what I like to see and not necessarily what everyone will expect. But in general, I like to see a thesis statement. I like an argument. Stuff that seems too general, like the kind of like I am going to explore statements, it can come across that the idea is a little underbaked. And again, this isn't universal. It, it can work. I just, in overall, I think it can be... Um, it can, it can seem like you haven't done a lot of work on it yet because you're like still in the exploration phase. So, you know, I, I like to hear something about the significance of XYZ, you know, or making some kind of an argument about it, hooking us in by having something to say, um, not just telling us you will do it or that we'll do it together <laughs> in, the, in the process of listening to the presentation. So the first couple sentences or first sentence can state a purpose, what problem it solves, um, an argument that you're going to persuade us of, why the reader should be interested. How much context you give will depend on what you're looking at. So this can be a little hard to know if you're trying to enter the field the first time. An obscure indie title um, might need a very brief intro to what the game is. Um, could just be general genre, barest outline of a plot. I don't think you need to really get into the details of the plot of a game. Um, because it can very easily take over the word count in an abstract. But in the paper, you might need to introduce a lesser known title more than if you're working on a Super Mario game. We're like, yeah, we kind of know how that is. Um, but this is also a good, in the context part, you can kind of show the committee that you know your literature. So if, um, if, if you just have very brief, like kind of parenthetical citations to some of the major work in the field, and I see that you're citing good stuff, then I'm, as a program committee member, I'm reasonably confident that you've done enough work to situate your stuff, not just repeat things that have already been done, you know, that it, it, it's kind of further along. We've had papers that don't cite the precedent. Um, and it's just kind of awkward because <laughs> then it just, then the Q&A just come, becomes kind of like, oh, maybe look at this going forward. Um, so I like to shout out the SSSMG bibliography. And let me post the link here in chat. Uh, this is the Society for the Study of Sound and Music and Games, SMIG. <laughs> you can kind of snake it with the S, SMIG. Um, they, they have a really beautiful, um, pretty up-to-date selective bibliography. Um, most of the online sources are linked, um, but you, you can also, uh, as members, you can submit entries. You can kind of claim things you've authored. Um, so this this can be nice instead of just going to like a, a database and typing in, you know, like JSTOR or something and then typing in a, a title of a game or something. You can kind of get a more specific curated list here of a lot of the major work in the field. So that can be a really good place to make sure that like that you are at least are aware of what's out there. So cursor research can keep you up, to, up on at least who's published on your game or on related things. You can also look through the past conferences section of the, uh, let me pull up north, uh, the NACVGUM past conferences section. I will link directly. All of those programs are also linked. Um, and so you can kind of see what's been presented, even if it hasn't come out in print yet. Um, you don't have to do this necessarily. I'm not saying that like you absolutely, you know, you're going to get dinged for a something that didn't come out in print. But just so you have a, a good lay of the land, um, just kind of familiarize yourself. That can be really useful. Um, it can also be useful to sometimes then if, if I see like, oh, somebody gave a paper on this thing and I'm really interested in getting into it, then I might want to connect with them on, on Twitter or send an email. Um, just, you know, see if they have a few minutes to talk about their work. Um, maybe see if it's in the process of being published or, or maybe it came out somewhere and I didn't see it. Um, sometimes I'm able to, to then see it that way. Some members of the program committee uh, really like to see a bibliography at the end, uh, which is, is considered separate from the abstract. Like, I wouldn't ever count that against a word count. I don't think, 
I don't think anybody does. Um, Others really don't need one. I think that it's kind of gatekeepy to suggest that we need to look for them. I, you know, I I think I I err on the side of you. Usually you've already done some research to start the paper. So it it never hurts to include it. And like nobody would count it against you to have one. So, Um, yeah. The the important thing being that you you want to situate this because otherwise we lead to my classic example and this isn't really me calling out anybody in particular um, but the classic example is you might get an abstract from someone being like oh Nobu Uematsu used light motif in Final Fantasy VI and like that's the abstract and you're like okay <laughs> like that's pretty well established at this point um, that there have been publications on that game specifically on uh, Uematsu's use of light motif in general like it's kind of not new it's like you kind of want to it's like yes and <laughs> what uh, like yes there's light motif so it can come across as kind of naive um, and a little awkward and and folks generally want to see a little bit more but for some games that haven't been worked on at all like doing light motif light motivic analysis might might be might be really interesting so this is where just like getting a sense of the lay of the land can be really really important um especially for these really canonic games (laughs) mats is the unquestioned beethoven of video game music uh what about koji kondo isn't koji kondo the beethoven (laughs) I I sometimes say that to Will and he gets mad. Uh, Beethoven, Beethoven of game music is such a, such a fraught phrase. It does really get used for Uematsu quite a bit. I have seen it used for Kondo as well, though. (laughs) It it rankles Will because he's just like, how about he's just the Uematsu of video game music? Why does he have to be the Beethoven? (laughs) Anyway, that's, that's a, that's a separate discourse. So yeah, in terms of the, the bibliography, the sort of citation anxiety, you know, I, I tend to, to be a little more conservative, a little more careful on that in that um, I just I, I think it's really good to to know what's out there and to know that your your the whole point of scholarship is discourse and building uh, on your own work or on others work and and bringing that's why we do the research that's why we do the citation um, it isn't just us coming in going well I like this game a lot and I looked at it and like that's a piece of it but like I'm also aware of of what else is out there so even when we've been on Twitch and are more public facing we've had a couple online only conferences uh, over the pandemic um, this is ultimately an academic conference for professionals in the field of music scholarship to get something out of it, to interact and share ideas and to help shape each other's work into the best version of itself. And so there, there is kind of a, a rigor that you can very easily signal and it doesn't necessarily have to run away with your word count, but just giving us a sense that, yeah, this is what's, what's out there and I'm, I'm aware of it and I'm, I'm going to engage with it. Maybe Beethoven's the Uematsu of classical. I love that. Quite possibly. So for the methods section, uh, you know, thinking of this along the, like an informative scientific abstract, um, you don't necessarily have to spell this out in any great detail, but I find it, it can be useful to suggest major methodological influences in maybe a word or two, uh, how you collected your data if you're doing something more empirical. Um, I saw a piece of advice online that I really liked saying that statements about what you did can almost always be replaced or rephrased as statements about your findings. So folks are generally going to be more interested in results, conclusions, or arguments than methods, and you can save words this way. But um, if you're coming from a very specific, you know, maybe ethnographic background, like you might want to indicate that that's kind of shaping the the study because it can also give us a clue like, oh, this, this person is coming from more of like an ethnomusicological method that, and we might want that, uh, want to bring that variety into the conference and kind of expand, um, you know, or somebody indicating that they did more of like a social science research relating to pedagogy because they have more of a music ed background or something. Um, in a very, very small number of words, you can usually convey that you're doing that type of work. So results. I always say don't be coy. <laughs> don't save the good stuff for the paper. Because if the committee isn't hooked up enough by the abstract, you won't get the chance to save the good stuff for the paper. You won't have space to give us everything. Um, 
and but when a paper seems like it kind of has no point or like it's in initial that initial exploratory phase i as a community committee member would rather see someone keep working um and let it percolate until they have a little something a little further along to show us so that's that's totally me saying that's my preference i I do know that there's people that are just brilliant thinkers that even when they are in that kind of amorphous phase, I may still be interested in what they have to say. But just overall, again, evaluating these not knowing who they are, um, I'm going to want to have, even if the, the eventual results change or you, like the, the resultant paper is very different, um, if you don't have any kind of argument or, or preliminary result or conclusion, um, I, I might be like less inclined to argue for that one overall (laughs) again it's uh it's just more it's a little bit more of a gamble if you if you go this way so it's not that you can't ever be successful if you don't have uh result some kind of result in there i just i think it can be a nice nice general thing to keep in mind putting in an, an example of space allows especially if you're looking at a number of different games um, but even within a game, you may look again at all the music, but uh, you may have just one quick example, but those are sort of the hardest to fit into the word count. So um, y- you might have to evaluate there what's more important. Um, it can be really useful to have keywords at the end. Again, this would be, I count this as separate from the the text. If you have like a 150 word or 250 word limit, I think I think AMS was 500, which was like an unbelievable. I'd never had one that large before, so <laughs> I was just like, "This is this is so big. I have so much space." Um, but most of the time, 150, 250, maybe 300 is common for a lot of places. So you may not have a lot of space uh, for your examples, but keywords, I I generally don't count those. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm pretty sure AMS was 500 because I remember feeling like I I was being able to add things in. Um, from the original abstract I had of the, the paper I got accepted. So that was kind of fun because I, I had already written and given that previous version. So uh, now I can be like, oh, here's some more stuff. <laughs> so I was able to pack it in. And it, I actually submitted my AMS abstract like very late. It was like right right on the deadline because I just kept tweaking and like couldn't, couldn't stop tinkering with my abstract and finally submit it. And it worked because I got in. But... A lot of times your abstract um, limits are going to be less than that, but um, they don't always spell this out in a call for papers, which is why I I say that um, unless it says like 300 words inclusive of keywords bibliography, you know, unless it says something that indicates it, I always just count the text of the abstract for that, for the word count. And then um, everything else, like it, it's nice to have. And I certainly don't mind it. I certainly don't uh, expect it if, if it's not in the call. For pa- if it's in the call for papers, obviously put in what they ask you for. But if not, um, you don't have to put keywords, but they, they could be helpful um, in that they organize your thinking by highlighting the most important aspects. Those little hashtags kind of al- also help us see the, the most important areas for the paper. And then finally, references. Um, we can talk about this more, but it can be helpful to include a perspective bibliography. And again, not everyone agrees this is necessary on program committees. Uh, and if, if they did, we again, we would just say in the call for papers, we, we want a bibliography. I like seeing them. They're not required or expected. And you can often get by with just a few well-placed in-text citations to indicate you've done the legwork. Um, but certainly you know you already have it just format it up in like chicago or whatever your style guide is um so that they read clearly and throw that along in there sometimes people also do images or like a couple musical examples um also not required or expected um i don't i don't these ones i actually say i don't think we really need musical examples or images I think we can often avoid them unless they are absolutely vital to the the work. It's just my preference. Um, I think that's one thing you can say for the actual presentation. Uh, usually you're able to sort of speak to an example um, briefly enough and know that you'll get into it in the actual talk. But again, just kind of depends on the, the preferences. So again, you don't have to do keywords, bibliography, or any images. Um, and nor do they necessarily count against your word count, but 
they they may be useful to you for different reasons. But very importantly and absolutely vital is content or trigger warnings. If your research deals with sensitive topics, certain kinds of violence, trauma, sexuality, pornography, child death is, is a good one. Um, you should spell this out as clearly as possible. Dealing with sensitive topics will not prevent you from being accepted. I've given papers on pornographic video games and disability fetishism in the past, for example, as well as child death, uh, a topic relating to that. But not showing care in presenting that material can give the organizers pause. Um, They're judging these abstracts without knowing who is behind them. So there are definitely folks that we trust to ethically and respectfully cover content if we see the name. But we don't see that information until after we've discussed the abstracts and made decisions. So creating a really good content warning allows conference organizers to know where to place you and to allow attendees a chance to prepare themselves or avoid potentially triggering content. It's just super important to take this sort of thing seriously. And again, I don't count trigger warnings in the word count, generally. And folks can indicate to me if they do. Um, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty strict that it's just the body of the, the abstract. So... I don't think we're going to run into issues there. And feel free to throw out questions along the way as we're going through all these. Some formatting stuff. This is all just preference. This is, (laughs) again, if it were required, it would be spelled out for you. Um, But I I like to advise double-spaced. It is just easy on the eyes. Um, (laughs) Sans serif or serif fonts. Uh, this is so nerdy, right? So, of course, a sans serif doesn't have the little flags. So, like, the I here in the word serif, if it was just a I, <laughs> just a single stroke. Um, those, those little, well, serifs <laughs> on the edge. Um, so you'll see fonts like, I don't know, Garamond, uh, Georgia, um, Times New Roman, that kind of stuff, um, versus uh, things that are a little bit more, I guess you could say, digital, uh, these sans serif fonts, things like Arial, Calibri, Futura. Um, uh, some folks will tell you to use a sans serif font if you're submitting electronically. So I think serifs are prettier. <laughs> and the, cl- the classical thinking is that sans serifs are better visually on screens or online and that serifs have a bit more physical presence and a weight that's better in print. Um, So I don't think this is entirely true um, because there are fonts with more or less presence in each category, but that's kind of a rule of thumb. So I would just say pick pick a font that's standard and not distracting because nobody will really bat an eye um, at things being in Times New Roman, Garamond, Arial, Calibri, that kind of stuff. Um, But don't don't make the font too fancy. And I'm a font nerd. Please don't submit in Comic Sans. <laughs> I, I'm kidding. I don't, I don't actually care that much about Comic Sans. It doesn't it doesn't bug me. There's a famous McSweeney's article from the perspective of Comic Sans that is full of profan- profanity and very amusing about you know how maligned that font is. Or like Papyrus gets a lot of a lot of like don't submit a, an abstract in Papyrus, please. It's just it's too visually distracting. Uh, you want something like boring <laughs> because again, it's, it's about the content um, and not getting in the way of that. There's uh, Beatrice Ward has a famous statement comparing uh, good typesetting and font usage to like having a crystal goblet that you put wine in versus, you know, one that's, that's pewter and maybe jeweled where you can't see the contents that you can't see the wine on the inside. Um And fonts can be the kind of the same way where you you aim for the crystal goblet so that your ideas are a little bit clearer. So it's just a subtle thing to think about. Um, I know I like to put things in different fonts, even when I'm drafting, Uh, or especially when I hit the editing stage, I stick things in a different font than I wrote them in because visually they're different now. So things jump out to me that I I might miss when I'm proofreading. Um, All useful. But when you go to submit, make sure it's in a very standard Boring, hashtag boring font. (laughs) Margins uh, are not really very particular on abstracts. I say a good old old one-inch margin never fails. Uh, Or, you know, just your 
if you have one of those one and a half inch on the sides, one on the top and bottom, like what, whatever that default is in, in Word, those are fine too. But again, don't do it. Just don't do anything weird. Don't mess with it. <laughs> don't go, oh, I want this all on one page. So I'm going to like make the margin like, you know, half a centimeter or something. Yeah, uh, honestly, uh, that that's a that's a fun tip to throw out there that I that I always tell people, especially when I hit dissertating, like in bigger bigger work, um, putting something in a different font. Um, it's always good to get other people to read your work because again, you kind of can't see the forest for the trees when it's your own work. You're kind of too in it, so you need to find ways to create that separation. Sometimes that means you're you're stepping away from it for a little bit, like a week or a month, or it depends how much time you have. Um, but things like this, where you're like, let me just change the font, or and uh, you know change the font size or something, um, can really make things pop out in a way. And then I also read everything out loud. No, but I read my entire 360 page dissertation to myself over the course of a, about a week as I was in that kind of final preparation. I, I used it as preparation for the defense, but then I also um, used it as I was prepping uh, for the formatting check and kind of the final submission. And it really helped catch things because when you're just reading in your head, you have a way of kind of skipping over issues uh with your kind of inner voice so yeah read it out loud change the font all good <laughs> all right so yeah don't do, basically don't uh, this all of this formatting stuff is about trying to avoid the visual element of it getting in the way of the content so again normal margin if you do anything unusual, it, it, it stands out and it's kind of distracting. And then like, I'm not saying that again, having a weird margin will, will mean you get rejected. It's just like, you kind of want to make things as easy as possible on your committee, um, visually and otherwise. So make sure the abstract has a title that isn't just abstract or a placeholder. Um, I find that really useful, especially again, when you think maybe we're downloading 50 of them. Um, or they're getting compiled into a single document. Um, it, it's just really helpful to have like, oh, right, that one was, you know, and again, that because your title is super clear and gives you a sense of the, oh, yeah, that's the one about that. Um, very helpful to have in. But that said, if you're used to having a uh, title with your, your name, uh, like some kind of a header with your institution, your name or email or any of that kind of stuff, make sure that you don't have identifying information on the abstract itself. All of, we call that metadata, uh, the, inf your name, your uh, affiliation, your, um, yeah, uh, institution affiliation, email, um, other forms of contact, all that stuff goes in the body of the email with the submission. So w when you were like, dear Nakfigam, attached, please find my abstract for this year's conference. Then below you'd say, here's my metadata. And then you put, you put your stuff. Um, but don't put it in the actual abstract because then the person in charge of it this year, it's me, um, will be downloading it and having to remove all that stuff. And then it's, it's like an extra step. It's kind of tedious because we don't want the, uh, the rest of the committee to see that data. They, we want them to be able to read it without any kind of indication as to who did the work so that we can just kind of evaluate things based on the content. All right. In general, um, ab most abstracts are one paragraph, but sometimes folks have a couple of short paragraphs, maybe two, sometimes three, but generally not more than that. Uh, in this case, you can either indent the paragraphs or have them unindented and use an extra line break between paragraphs, which is kind of more of a web page look. I haven't seen anybody make a fuss about either form um, as long as it just looks clean on the page. So kind of use, use your eye on that. You don't really need page numbers because an abstract usually isn't a ton of pages. So, you know, I guess you could put them in, but you really don't have to. I guess if you if you include like a bibliography, then maybe, but otherwise absolutely you don't have to, but just make sure everything looks looks very clean and organized on the page. So, some of the specific tips and tricks. Use active voice whenever possible, not only because it tends to be simpler and more direct, but it's also going to save you in your word count. It's less wordy. A lot of passive voice constructions get convoluted and take up extra words. 
So, you know, when you, the classic, (laughs) what is active voice? You know, I, let's see, I should come up with like a not dumb example, (laughs) you know, subject, uh, verb, you know, Dana read the book versus, I don't know, the book was read by Dana, um, you're adding all of this like kind of convoluted uh you know sometimes extra word that's like that's such a basic example but a lot of words can come into um something being acted upon by the subject instead of the subject acting um and then then you get extra words and also it can become a lot less clear what what's going on so i i think it's it's just a nice thing to try to use active voice um and passive voice, I don't mind at all in academic writing in general. It's just for abstracts. I think active voice can save you some words. Tense can really depend. If you are proposing a paper you've already written, you might feel free to use past tense throughout for completed work. Uh, if it's new work you're proposing, you might use past to describe research steps and more of a future tense for what you're going to do when you present. Um, I would say just try to try to be consistent and make it really clear. Um, but I, I, I like to have some consistency to the tense. Draft the abstract first, then edit for word count. So, and I have a hard time. I'm one of these people that is always like kind of editing as I write. And then instead of just like thinking of just get it on paper and then do it. So I still work on this to this day, but I have to remind myself, just get it, get everything out, (laughs) make sure all the components are there. And then I can start really drilling away for word count. I already said this, but and just recently, but read aloud to yourself. Um, reading in your head, again, means you might skip over errors. And again, this is where you can change the font too. So saying it out loud has a way of helping you catch little things. But beyond just catching objective errors, reading out loud helps you just imp- improve your flow and make sure that you're varying your prose enough in terms of sentence structure and avoiding redundant phrases. So I, re- I recommend this for all writing including, again, my 360-page dissertation (laughs) that I read over the course of a week. Uh, Very good prep for my defense. Maybe a little overkill, but it it was great. And then it, again, had paid dividends in the editing, too. Um, Yeah, so I I find that it improves my flow. I kind of recognize how I started a couple sentences with the same thing. I used the same redundant phrase more than once. Um, so I can, I can cut one of them and reword. So it like, it helps you kind of figure out how to cut things down. Look for adjectives and adverbs that you can eliminate. I also have a problem with this. <laughs> I'm a very descriptive writer. I, I, I read a lot of poetry, you know, and I, I like things to sound pretty. And so often I'm, I'm kind of adding in things I don't necessarily need. And my advisor used to tell me, you use a lot of ad- adjectives. So that's a very easy place to cut. Can I just get away with the noun? <laughs> keep it keep it simpler. Uh, which ones do I need or not need? I, I also tell people kind of avoid using ellipses and sort of incomplete sentences because it may come across to you as that kind of thoughtful, inquisitive uh, peaking of someone's interest like oh it's so compelling well, like what's the end of that sentence and you, you, I don't know you picture the grizzled academic stroking the beard with their like elbow patches on their jacket or something uh, when they just sort of trail off because they're lost in thought I don't know it doesn't have that effect <laughs> on the other end though um, it, it just it just looks unpolished and complete so I don't I don't like ellipses in general I guess if, if you're gonna put a direct quote in and you're doing the thing where you're cutting some of the direct quote you could have it in there but even then I don't really recommend putting a lot of quotations in (laughs) you know because the lit review can happen in the paper itself we don't want it to take up real estate from your stuff the abstract is all about you with maybe a couple brief mentions of work that has been done by other people but you don't need to get into the specifics of quoting them most of the time so uh, ellipses can generally be avoided. So quotes can also generally be avoided. Try to avoid uh, acronyms. S- spell them out. Um, 
and specialized jargon. There are certain things you won't have to define for this crowd. So if you're working in video games and you have a console like the NES or the SNES, I would not bat an eye at seeing that just written NES and not enter Nintendo Entertainment System. If you were proposing the same abstract to AMS, American Musicological Society, or you know one of these conferences that isn't specifically about uh, media, and you might you might need to spell out Nintendo Entertainment System. So uh, it is a little bit about knowing your audience, but um, try to avoid acronyms spell them out at first usage and then if you have to use the term again then you can default to the the acronym itself but you just want to avoid confusion lastly my favorite tip is that gerunds are your friend <laughs> or basically the kind of ing forms of verbs versus an infinitive so walking versus to walk um this is one of my number one tips to cut one word at a time because instead of to walk, two words, now you have walking, which is one word. So if once you have the abstract drafted, this is something you can do to, to tighten it up. So I'll give through an, I'll give an example as we work through an abstract. Okay. So I will post the link in chat as well. I still have this up from last time. So there's the link you can follow. Obviously, there's QR code, too. Um, I have a couple uh, examples of other folks' abstracts and my friends. So thank you all for allowing me to use your abstracts. Um, and we're going to talk through what's effective about these. Um, so there's the link. Um, there's the QR code on the screen so you can follow along. So I'm giving that a moment for us all to get there. But yeah. All right, the three, I don't remember what I have after this. What do I have? Yeah, I just have kind of a blank screen, so we'll sit there for a bit. Well, actually, I'll just leave it up on that. All right, so our first one is uh, Pete Smucker's uh, Gaming Sober Playing Drunk Sound Effects of Alcohol in Video Games, which is now a publication that we have featured on this channel. Yay! Um, but this, this was a conference version um, of that what became that publication. So let me just read, <coughs> read the entire thing and then point out a couple good things. This paper develops a framework for associations between sounds, video games, and alcohol. Some recent studies, Cowart and Quant 2016, Cranwell et al. 2016, examine concerns regarding representations of drugs and alcohol in video games, while others, Montgomery 2006, Schultheis and Morant 2001, use virtual reality to simulate intoxication. These studies primarily focus on the presence and stereotypical use of alcohol, but offer little attention to related sounds and music or the increased integration between sound design and gameplay. This paper lays historical, cultural, and music theoretical groundwork for creating an associative soundscape of alcohol and multimedia experiences, particularly video games. I first defined four primary areas of inquiry into sonic representations of alcohol and multimedia. One, sound iconography, which highlights representative sound, sounds of objects and personal behaviors. Two, sound environments or unique sonic locations and settings. Three, Musical depictions of drunkenness, such as the use of specific orchestrations and cultural influences. And four, simulation of intoxication, which looks specifically at altered sonic perceptions and experiences. I then demonstrate attributes of these four features through, an, through examples from the following video games and other media. Bioshock, Red Dead Redemption, the Final Fantasy franchise, Warner Brothers cartoon High Note, World of Warcraft, a 2017 advertisement for, series for Bush Beer, and others. I conclude the paper by considering a larger context of sound and music studies related to alcohol, drugs, and ad addiction. Take a sip of water after that. So much more talking when I don't have a guest on. Okay, so again, you can have it in front of you because it is a link that is open. Uh, right off the bat, uh, sentence one, this paper develops a framework for associations between sounds, video games, and alcohol. Couldn't start clearer. Sums up the entire project concisely. Sentence two, I really enjoy, this is where we have the, the why water, it's Friday afternoon, 
because I, I made a, a French press of coffee. Um, but my father-in-law brought us lunch. And so I split, I normally like one French press is like two good cups of coffee for me. And that's kind of my, I just make one of those a day. Um, and I split it with him. So I only had one, the one cup of coffee earlier. (laughs) So normally I would have my, I'd have a cup of coffee sitting here, but yeah, it's Friday afternoon. Well, that's okay. I have pumpkin hard cider in the fridge for this evening. So we will have, have some fun later. (laughs) I think Joe and I are going to watch like a spooky movie or something. We did that last night as well (laughs) because we didn't stream. It was super fun. Yeah. Um, sentence two, I really like here because this is where we have the parenthetical citations. So there's Coward and Quant, Cranwell, um, Montgomery, 2006, all those. That is the sentence where Pete is situating the work here and demonstrating that, you know, this work on alcohol and video games has occurred in game studies. Um, And it sets up the idea that, you know, the problem he's solving or whatever, uh, nobody's worked on this in terms of sounds and music. So it not only gives context, shows that he's done some research on it already, understands what's out there, but then he's also then giving us a strong rationale for this paper to exist. Like, okay, this stuff is there, but nobody's looked at this in sound and there is a sound component to this. So instantly you're like, oh, cool. This needs to, this needs to be here. I need to see this. Um, Yeah. So, and, and says, you know, these studies focus on the presence and use, little, little attention to sound and music. So there, that final sentence of that first paragraph ends up being our rationale and shows how this paper is going to fill that gap. So even says the historical, cultural, music, theoretical groundwork, it really gives a sense or the reader a sense of the methodology and what discourses he's going to draw from in his research and then contribute to with the eventual paper. The second paragraph um, gives enough specifics to make clear that Pete already had primary conclusion, preliminary conclusions at this point, um, because he he had done enough to have the four primary areas of inquiry, like kind of the categories. He's building this framework. Here's some of the things he's concluded that he's going to present to us as a way to thinking about the phenomenon. And then at the end, uh, he was able to fit in in a you know very general way the specific examples so instead of just i'm going to look at these sounds in video games or i'm going to explore you know pete actually gave us titles he said bioshock red red dead redemption etc um and it didn't have to encompass every example but it, it's very useful if you're not doing a case study of a single game to just demonstrate a couple of the relevant examples like this as you, as you have space to do so Mentioning the major titles and franchises shows us that this is a framework that's meant to apply widely in gaming, but also draws upon or is in conversation with cultural codes present in cartoons and TV commercials. So it ends up connecting it to this broader process of signification. And then in this one, Pete actually had a a bibliography on the second page. So again, uh, carefully curated bibliography can be really interesting, um, especially if somebody is going to be referring outside of the Ludo literature and showing us more game studies, things that the committee might not have read themselves. I like it. It helps situate things for me. Okay, so the next one on the list is, uh, this is from Karen Cook, uh, and I love this work, and I think it's I don't know if Karen's still in chat. Maybe I think this one's in process, right? This one's being published. I'm I'm so excited to see this come out. I love this. This is June Shikuma's soundtrack for Fazanadu, 1987. I said I said it right. I didn't say Faxanadu, which is what we like to call it on stream. <laughs> Fazanadu. Um, so again, I'll read this and then kind of point to some of my favorite parts of it. Um, but yeah, I think this one is, it's in progress. Yay. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah. I remember, I remember you mentioning that you had gotten like some peer edit, peer review, something, something back on this that, or you had sent it to people to look at before you submit it or something, something like that. Uh, I can't wait. Anyway, uh, Fazanadu is an action adventure role-playing a game released by Hudson Soft in 1987. It was well received, ranking number six in Nintendo Power's top 30 games, but was soon forgotten except by its diehard fans until its port to the Wii Virtual Console in 2010. Its soundtrack was composed by Jun Chikuma, whose work for the Bomberman series often appears in, quote, hidden video game music gems lists, but like Fazanadu itself has also been overlooked. 
In this presentation, I discuss how Chikuma's soundtrack both aligns with and pivots away from then-burgeoning sonic expectations for action RPGs and video games writ large. Citation to Gibbons and Rayleigh 2019, which is the, the green book. Like other contemporary composers, she utilizes familiar fantasy and medievalist musical tropes, Cook 2019. But she makes heavier use of mode mixture and chromatic melodies, and she avoids stasis in looped themes by layering new melodic or contrapuntal material. More unusual are her treatments of the triangle channel, which occasionally has the melody, and the noise channel, which contains a surprising variety of rhythmic patterns and fills. Whereas an RPG town theme is often simple, calm, pastoral, and melodic, Chikuma's is syncopated, angular, and energetic. Gibbons 2017. Lastly, her final boss theme inverts musical material heard earlier in the game, shaping the soundtrack into a giant arch form. Her soundtrack is thus not only a fascinating case study in its own right, but also an alternative approach to scoring video games at a time when recognizable game music tropes were beginning to coalesce. Plank 2019. It's wait. Oh, it's waiting on. <laughs> it's Fazanadu's waiting on Andrew. <sighs> That's exciting. I can't wait. Fazana do the Zelda 2 of non Zelda NES games. Oh, yeah. Zelda 2 is so hard. I love Zelda 2's music, um, but I've only beaten it once, and it was like well into my adulthood. I could never beat it because it's so punishing. You die and you like, it, you get sent all the way back to the beginning. It's, it's very, very hard. Anyway, I love this abstract for so many reasons. Um, all of these. That's why I put them in. <laughs> so right at the beginning, the first sentence, Fizanadu is an action adventure role playing game released by Hubs Hudson Soft in 1987. Note how that opening doesn't assume that readers or players will know this game. So again, if you're talking about Mario, Final Fantasy, Zelda, you don't have to necessarily do this. <laughs> but the just a few extra words, and this is a very compact sentence too, um, shows you like how easy it is to describe the genre, the publisher, and the year that situates the game for us, um, for folks who don't know it. I, I think that, that that is just like chef's kiss for, you know, efficiency in in contextualizing the game for us. The then we get in the the rest of the paragraph how the game, you know, talking about how it became a hidden gem, it emerged more recently, having a, a second life and kind of potential new relevance to modern players. Um, and here's a good example where we can cut a single word. You know, it says it was well, well received ranking number six in the top 30 games. If Karen had written, it was well received semicolon, it ranked number six, that adds an extra word. So using the ing form of the verb, <laughs> verb means that we were able to kind of eliminate, uh, a word here. Um, it just it worked well. Um, I'm a big fan. So very concise language and just packed with information. The third line brings up uh, the composer, uh, Jun Chikuma, and also the citation to uh, her other work on like the Bomberman series. Um, and it connects it to a more popular title that folks are a little more likely to have heard of. And it starts to build a why should we care about this game's music argument. I was, I was talking actually with Karen recently about an undergrad proposing a, a final paper topic, and I was struggling with their, their thesis. It was technically an argument that there could be disagreement about sides of, and I was, I was trying to kind of explain to the student like why, why it wasn't a good thesis and why we needed to kind of keep refining, because they were like, well, I don't understand. It is an argument. Um, and Karen's comment, which I then kind of repeated back to the student, was, you know, ultimately <laughs> you can have a thesis and have someone go so what you know why should we care so you kind of need to re have a rationale um it isn't enough to just necessarily have a something that exists as an you know you could have something saying that like um i don't know this this work is the most uh famous uh, not this game but you know you could say it like this is jun takuma's most famous soundtrack that's technically an argument because like how do you quantify fame or whatever but ultimately like why is that important um what what other thing is that highlighting for you that that this soundtrack is more famous than that one or something like that was this a 10 minute paper i don't remember might have been i love i love lightning talks they're so good. They're so like jam packed. They always leave you wanting more. <laughs> I love doing them myself. I love encouraging people to do them. They're great. Um, but anyway, so the um, 
we get a little bit of starting to build out the rationale of like, okay, this is Jun Chikuma. You may have heard of her other work, but like Fazanadu has also been overlooked. Um, the next paragraph, we kind of get our main thesis, an idea for the paper. Um, discuss how her soundtrack aligns with and pivots away from the sonic, then burgeoning sonic expectations, blah, blah, blah. Um, it gives the significance of the specific score, but also helps demonstrate genre conve conventions in action RPGs, as well as demonstrate how Chikuma cleverly pivots away from these expectations. And it has just these beautifully deployed citations to situate the work in the major edited collection on music in the RPG to demonstrate she's aware of major work in the field. She contributed to that volume, but um, the, the Plank 2019, that's me, <laughs> my... This is like a sophisticated deployment of the literature at, at the very end where she she mentions me because I was writing about like a totally different game. It's not like she just, you know, found somebody else who published on Vasanadu and she's doing that citation. Uh, she's taking my central argument about how early some of these game music tropes were beginning to coalesce was kind of one of the points of my, my chapter, even though it was about a totally different game and, and then uses it here. So the, in the uh, Gibbons 2017, he was establishing um, RPG town themes in, in, in that one and sort of the, the features of them. So you can see like those take two, two words basically to set up cook 2019 Gibbons 2017. Um, but we still have very clear deployment of the literature. Uh, yeah. So then we have the, uh, heavier use of mode mixture and chromatic melodies avoid stasis you know all that stuff kind of getting into the meat of it sets up the rpg scoring conventions that will be addressed and then the rest of the space is giving is given over to giving us a solid sense of how far along the work really is karen at this point had done enough analysis to really know what makes the score special um, and was being really specific about telling us the findings and arguments instead of being coy about it. This is the part that makes me as a reader go like, yes, <laughs> this is so well thought out. It's absolutely a point where I want to hear about it at a conference. And then, you know, the final sentence was memorable, had a strong ending, kind of gave, gave a final rationale and significance of the paper. Also mentioned the specific methodology, that it was a case study of a single video game with another citation, which was really effective. Um, so just really, really compact and beautiful. Yeah, lightning talk. Oh, love lightning talks. Oh, and it's it's on the Nakvukum YouTube. We should link that. All right. Next up, uh, we have Julianne Grasso. Music narrative and affect and journey, twenty twelve. So again, I'll read this. <coughs> There's an oft-cited debate, in scare quotes, <laughs> debate in game studies between the ludologists and the narratologists that boils down to whether we should understand video games as formal systems or as mediums of storytelling. The difference between ludic and narrative in this formulation relies on the notion that the gameness of games, ludo, and the storiness of stories, narrative, are complementary but opposing forces in game design. Rather than erecting that straw man myself by entering into a long-expired, even imaginary argument, I use this dual ludo-narrative conceptualization of game design as a framework for employing a useful analytical heuristic. What if we threw music in to see what happens? Taking as a premise that musical structures influence play in ways that are conceptually parallel to ludic and narrative structures, I argue for an understanding of video game play through a ludo-musical narrativity. Using the game Journey, that game company 2012, as a primary case, I show how musical parameters constrain play into narrative understandings. For example, progress through a presumably open world is marked through an opening of both the diatonic scale and its harmonic underpinnings. Further, this gradual musical unlocking constitutes an experience of play that can be understood through David Huron's 2006 theory of musical expectations, helping us understand the particular affective poignancy of Austin Wintory's score by creating affective bounds of play that are synchronized to action, the music of Journey doesn't merely color the world, but also structures the experiences of play and narrative within it. Very cool. So opening up the ludology narratology debate, very well known in game studies, kind of a foundational issue in defining the field when it started. 
Um, so connect into a well-known discourse, um, presumably to connect it in some way to music. Um, very, very useful opening. With, um, with more space, or if pitching to a broader audience than Nakfagum specifically, Julianne probably would have tried to throw in some kind of a parenthetical citation of a couple of the major names to show fluency with the scholarship on like ludology, narratology. Um, but I think this is a case where most of the folks evaluating the abstract should generally be very familiar with this debate and like know that there are a lot of people involved. Um, Janet Murray was kind of on, on one side, but there were, there were kind of a lot on the ludology side, right? <laughs> um, like Gonzalo Frasca. Um, I'm trying to think who all, Jesper Yule, I think, had some things that were more on the, the ludology. Um, yeah, never <laughs> take the correct side of the issue. Uh, yeah, narratology versus ludology continues, right? Um, so yeah, she doesn't actually, you know, just she doesn't cite um, Marie or any of these any of these people involved in this debate because this was kind of knowing the audience a little bit and knowing like game people are gonna like if I if I just refer to the debate itself, people know what I'm talking about. Um, again, if if Julianne were looking to do this for a non-game. Uh, literate audience um, she might uh, want to signal in some way what that is um, she does kind of explain the differences in the stances but she might want to throw a citation in there um, but simply referencing it brings to mind a list of names we're assuming she's read because she's synthesizing and critiquing the debate so seamlessly and very succinctly so your mileage may vary um since i i have said that some folks on program committees are really big on preliminary bibliographies and demonstrating fluency with the literature um but she kind of saves that space she does have citation of like david huron um in the second paragraph. So it does seem like the literature is well utilized, but here's a case where like, it's, it's, it's not like she's putting citations all over the place to do that. She's sort of synthesizing the, the discourses and it works really well. All right. Then, oh yeah, the second paragraph or the second sentence explains a bit about what ludology versus narratology entails, which is useful for a broad audience that may not have read all the back and forth surrounded ha surrounding uh janet murray's hamlet on the holodeck <laughs> but also suggests uh that julianne is a little skeptical of the debate itself she uses you know the the word strong man long expired and even imaginary argument <laughs> uh to to throw a little bit of of shade on the whole idea because her whole project is about thinking of the ludo and narrative as forces in game design that music may have an important influence on. She's actually bringing them together and saying that like they don't need to be separated. Um, so it's, it's kind of an elegant pivot. And then, yeah, she said in that kind of end, we get end uh, sentence from that paragraph. We get rather than erecting the straw man itself by entering into a long expired, blah, blah, blah. Uh, again, notice we get erecting instead of a more wordy construction, like rather than attempting to erect the straw, you know, like <laughs> you can imagine ways that you would write this very fluidly and naturally and then go back to it. Um, and here it's just like more compact. So it fits into the word count better. We also get, um, where is it? Um, in the end of the sentence as a framework for employing um, instead of something like as a framework to employ or as a framework where we might employ. So again, ING verbs help cut down on that word count. I um, mean, you can look for those those little um, to is a word that can often get cut, to employ, you know, where you have something in kind of that, that infinitive form. I really like how catchy the last bit of that first paragraph is, though. What if we threw music in to see what happens? Um, it serves as a purpose statement <laughs> a little bit where you're just like, oh, OK, here's what you're going to do. <laughs> the language draws the reader in. The tone reads really, really well, even not knowing necessarily that this was by Julianne. Like it, it just had like a very natural sound to it. Um, and I just I just like it's playful unto itself so like there's a little bit of like there's julianne's voice coming through there what if we threw music in to see what happens i love that um and i found that very compelling in reading this one the second paragraph posits the theorizing that happens in the presentation 
and gives us a sense of the methodology. So, okay, we're going to develop a Ludo musical narrativity that triangulates gameplay, narrative, and music. She demonstrates the methodology. She says uh, using the game journey as a primary case. So, okay, she's going to use a case study methodology. Um, she's showing what she will show through journey and then give a specific, clearly explained example to leave the, the reader at the end wanting to see and hear the rest. All right. Cool stuff. And then finally, I had one of my own, but I think we can skip that. <laughs> uh, that's my Untitled Goose Game one. I'm just looking through my notes. Like, do I have anything worth saying on my own abstract? Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, I don't know. So in, the, in that one, I do a lot of the same types of signposting where I'm trying to indicate a little bit of the, the research that I'm citing in children's media. Um, I indicate the, uh, the methodology a little bit. I, I get into some of the specifics from the, like showing that I had already done quite a bit of analysis um, and that I was aware of the implementation for the game. I did have some cutesiness. <laughs> I, I talked about driving the, the residents to their beaking point instead of breaking point. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, so I did, I did try to keep the puns to a minimum, but I was looking at a fundamentally silly game, so I wanted to kind of preserve that. Um, so I, I had to give a bit of an outline of the plot. I then kind of get into how the score works specifically and then what I'm talking about, um, situating it in, in musical reuse. Um, but if all I did was point out that there was musical reuse of WC and then say that I plan to look into how the use of pre-existing music in this new context influenced the game, that would tell me like it's not really far enough along. At this point, I already had an argument about what was effective about the score um, and then I, I get into specifics about the, the solo pianos, open intervals, the modal tinged harmonies, the rhythmically playful syncopations, dynamic contrasts, and, and then I kind of compare that to and, and situate it in the rest. So that's all I'm going to say about that one. <laughs> the next bit, as you scroll down, um, you will see that I have several examples of the same abstract. So this is kind of the final bit here in that we will, oh yeah, Espinar, so thank you. That's another ludologist. I was trying to think, there's like so many people that come up uh, that I follow closely and enjoy. But yeah, there's a lot of a lot of great work on ludology and narratology. And I think most people recognize that it's, uh, it's good to use both. <laughs> Just depends what you're looking at with the games. Um, there are times for more narratological methods. There are times for more like ludological, structural, you know, Cody type sides of things. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, I thought maybe as a hopefully useful exercise, I took an abstract of mine from several years ago. Um, Paul Webb's score for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, 1991. And I took the version that existed that was actually the the proposed version uh, that was accepted that I got to give at, at the conference but then I sort of unwrote it into a couple successive successively worse versions and the idea here is that we can go through um, kind of a bad version of an abstract. I tried to not make it cartoonishly exaggerated. Um, I wanted it to be kind of realistically um, subpar, if that makes sense. And, you know, maybe I was more, that was actually kind of hard to, hard, hard to think through, like how I wanted to do it. It was actually easier to do the one, the middle one that was like close to the final version, but like still wasn't quite there. Um, but yeah, I thought we could go through the successive versions and sort of look at a few different things that can improve the abstract um, to a version that would get accepted. Okay, so <laughs> the hopefully not unrealistically bad one, but here's the bad version of Paul Webb's score for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, 1991. Uh, it opens with a quote. I've seen knights in armor panic at the first hint of battle, and I've seen the lowliest unarmed squire pull a spear from his own body to defend a dying horse. Nobility is not a birthright. It's defined by one's actions. Kevin Costner, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. 
Adaptation is a growing area of interest in media studies, and I think that it deserves a closer look. In this paper, should I be accepted, I plan to explore in depth Paul Webb's score for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, 1991, to see how it compares to Michael Kamen's score for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, 1991, focusing on tracks for the title screen and the first level in battle, showing how they immerse and entertain the player. In the game, Webb's score sound as though it's derived from Renaissance dance music, and I will find Webb's early music sources and discuss the features of this music that seem to work well in the game to imply the world of Robin Hood and his merry men, such as Little John and Alan Adale. In this paper, I will show how immersion works through analysis of several game tracks and show how the game differs from the movie because of its need to create immersion in the player. The NES may not have been able to play samples of lutes or capture the voices of the troubadours for our game ears, but it is still able to capture some of the energy and fun of a medieval dance, including some of the limitations of instrumentation found in earlier forms of musical style. Okay, so hopefully that sounded like not just like laughably bad, like realistically could have gotten this in in the mix. (laughs) So first off, Save the epigraph for the actual presentation. (laughs) It reads a little as though I didn't know how to start the abstract. It is a quote from the movie, but it's not really related to what the abstract is about. And man, does that waste a lot of words. Let let me do a a word count really quick. 48 words. (laughs) 48 words wasted on on that epigraph. Uh, So really don't need that, right? Like, yeah, it's a cute quote and everything, but like put that in the, if you need to have that, put it and it relates in some way, put it in the actual presentation. Okay, so then sentence one after that, adaptation is a growing area of interest in media studies, and I think that it deserves a closer look. We get a lot of statements like this, like indicating like, yeah, there's a literature on this, but nothing here indicates that I've read anything on adaptation, specifically relating to musicology or in film and media studies more broadly. So a citation would really help here, or at least a more interesting statement about adaptation than just saying people are talking about it. Okay, the second sentence I say in this paper, should I be accepted? First person's fine, but I think this kind of like, should I be accepted, wastes a lot of space. It also seems to signal here that I haven't done a lot of research yet, that I've mostly just picked a game I'm interested in talking about, but haven't really done any analysis or figured out what I want to say about it yet. Because if I had more, I would would be cutting, I would be able to cut that in, in favor of the other stuff. And then the right after in this paper should I be accepted I plan to explore in depth that kind of gets at a methodology case study right I I mentioned the specific game but it also reflects um the again plan to explore in depth kind of indicates that I haven't done it yet maybe I have though like and that's that's something I need to be aware of maybe what I was trying to say was that like I plan to like with the audience like walk them through this explore you know be their guide to this game um explore it with you i think some people sometimes people are thinking of it that way um but in this case like it come, can come across as well have you done the work yet like what do you what do you have to say on it yet um and then i also put in some just like objective little like proofreading errors that again generally won't like be a problem in and of themselves like if i if i catch that somebody has misplaced punctuation or something like that um it's not like i'll be like no you can't be in the conference but excessive errors can can get in the way um it's kind of like i said with formatting that you you don't want to be distracting Uh, and so there there are little conventions and things that i got i purposely messed up here to show that so for example I say Paul Webb score for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, 1991. And I put that in quotes and then said to see how that compares to Michael Kamen's score for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, 1991. And I put that in italics. So generally, uh, what we consider major works, film titles, game titles, and books are italicized. And shorter works like article titles and song titles are the things that are in quotation marks. So it was partially that this wasn't it wasn't also it also wasn't consistent because uh, the next time I talk about uh, yeah I talk, I talk about the the game and the the film but I, I I italicize the one and I quote the other so it it jumps out as being a little weird now um, the rest of the sentence you'll notice I had to repeat the title because the game was based on the movie that had the exact same name 
there's probably a way, a way I could write around that, right? I, that redundancy of saying, I'm going to look at the score for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, 1991 to see how it compares to Michael Kamen's score for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, 1991. Ooh, <laughs> it's easy to change around and just show the film and the game have the same name. You could say, uh, you know, well, oh, we'll get to that in su successive versions so we can fix that. All right. Uh, where... Yes. Um, so then uh, further in that in sentence, I say focusing on tracks for the title screen and first level and battle and showing how they immerse and entertain the player. In there, to save some words, I could easily use commas instead of the awkward double and. So I could say focusing on tracks for the title screen, comma, first level, comma, and battle. Um, and then that saves a couple ands, you know, and, and sometimes with these abstracts, those couple words really make a difference in, in getting it to that word count. All right, next sentence. In the game, Webb's score sound as though it's derived. So I, I put lack of proofreading. You know, there's an error with number agreement. It should be Webb's score sounds as though. Um, excellent. So I say Webb's score sounds as though it's derived from Renaissance dance web music. And I find Webb's, notice the second Webb in the sentence I misspelled. Um, so you want to make sure that you proofread and make sure composer names and scholars names are spelled correctly, including any accents. It is their name. <laughs> like it is, you do not get the name wrong. Uh, you know, figure out the, if you need like the keyboard shortcut to get the accent or uh, like look up the person's name and copy and paste it, you know, and, and reformat it. Like if you're having a hard time getting the specific uh, accent symbol, but like, make sure that that's correct. And if you repeat the name more than once in the abstract, they should match. Um, and I noted here that spell check wouldn't catch Webb's early music sources. And that's the second misspelling where I only have the one B, um, because Webb is a word. So this is the case where like a lot of people have last names that are real existing words. So if you, if you spell it wrong, then, you know, <laughs> it's not going to catch it. And so you have to make sure you're, you're catching that and that you're consistent so that people aren't like, wait, you know, is that a different person or, you know, what's going on here? I also make no comment. I mentioned that, okay, the web score sounds as, sound as though it's derived from Renaissance dance music. I made no comment on the fact that Robin Hood isn't set in the Renaissance. It's almost like I hadn't noticed or considered it yet. <laughs> Or like I'm just not interrogating it because it all gets sort of collapsed and subsumed for me under the label of early music. So that's more of just like a, uh, a you know, knowing knowing what I gave for the paper that was actually something that was very interesting, uh, where that that incongruity jumped out to me immediately, where I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Robin Hood isn't in the Renaissance, you know, but the, the, we have this like Renaissance dance music element. So I, I don't unpack that. So like there you have a crumb that's kind of interesting, but you bury it in all this unnecessary stuff. All right. And then I say, um, and I will find Webb's early music sources and discuss the features of this music that seem to work well in the game to imply the world of Robin Hood. Yeah. I have repetition there where I talk about, you know, uh, early music sources, features of this music. Like, it's a little, it's just a little redundant. Like, it's hard to not repeat the word music or game in these abstracts, but that can be a place to look. Like, is there a way to kind of word around where I don't have to repeat exactly the same word again? <laughs> Renaissance and Beagle, it's all the same thing, right? And and Will Gibbons has talked about how how uh, you know the generic oldness of using like anachronistic classical music to just kind of imply a certain era uh, in like pirates, for example, or you know, some of these earlier games. Um, that totally happens, and it happens. Uh, there's a whole whole realm of medievalism on this, right? That where we look at uh, we don't just point out that things are anachronistic. That's not really interesting in and of itself, but we do get into uh, some of the ramifications of having these anachronisms that's the more interesting thing all right uh let's see discuss the features of this music that seem to work well in the game to imply the world of robin hood and his merry men such as little john and alan adale very tangential right like perhaps while drafting i thought it added a dash of like robin hoodie color to the proceedings but like why why do i have to say who's in the merry men <laughs> why do i have to oh such as little john and alan adale um, also, Ellen Adale isn't in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, like not even in the relevant 
example. <laughs> so that's fun. Will Scarlet is, but even then he's not even as important as the invented character of Azim for Morgan Freeman's character. Um, so this kind of shows that I'm not familiar enough with either the film or the game because Helena Dale does not appear. <laughs> um, I'm just kind of like, again, trying to add like Robin Hoodie color, but it's it doesn't really do anything. Um, and then I have, in this paper, I will show how immersion works through analysis of several game tracks and show how the game differs from the movie because of its need to create immersion in the player. I threw this in <laughs> uh, to kind of show, uh, this. I have a little soapbox about immersion. It kind of almost makes an argument about the difference between film and game, suggesting the need to create immersion is a big difference between them. But it, I, to me, the sentence doesn't ex inspire any confidence that I'm going to somehow explain how immersion works. Like anyone that knows anything about the immersion literature knows that it's it's fast. It's a very complex topic. And so I'm not going to solve that in a single paper. Um, so many papers claim that they're going to come up with some kind of grand unified, unified theory of immersion uh, or musical immersion specifically and explain it to us. And I see this a lot with like game sound con um, and some of the more like public um, or industry facing conferences. And I'm usually skeptical of these claims. I've rarely seen folks deliver anytime they try to do something too big. So really think about your scope. Immersion is a huge literature unto itself in game studies alone because it's something so associated with what makes games special as a medium. And this paper discussing that a game's music is immersive is not the same as explaining how immersion works. So like it's ultimately irrelevant to the work I'm trying to do. This is kind of up there in my pet peeves along with folks trying to write about major franchises as if no one has ever looked at them before. Again, the the Final Fantasy VI example. Did you know Uematsu used leitmotif? Like... <sighs> so in this case, like clearly... I, I don't I don't really know where I where I'm trying to go with this paper because I I'm saying like I want to look at the adaptation I want to look at the differences between the the music in the film scored by one person and the music in the game scored by somebody else um, I mentioned that I'm gonna track down the early the early music sources of Webb's music. <laughs> Like, okay, so then I'm going to do some kind of like detective work. Then I'm going to somehow also in a 20 minute talk show how immersion works. What? Too much. Too much. Okay. Then the uh, last sentence, the NES may not have been able to play samples of lutes or capture the voices of the troubadours for our game ears, but it is still able to capture some of the energy and fun of a medieval dance, including some of the limitations of instrumentation found in earlier forms of musical style. So I said this is not necessarily an issue. But if this was going anywhere but Nakfagum, I'd want to spell out the console's name instead of using an uh, acronym. I also probably would have indicated that the game was for the NES when I first mentioned the game. And then I had... Uh, you know, I, t I talk about the place... Uh, they weren't able to play samples of lutes or capture the voices of the troubadour for our game ears. Game, game, is it, it's in quotes. Am I trying to make a pun? <laughs> like what, what's happening here? Uh, am I trying to like make a pun on gamers, game ears? Um, it, it's not good. It's not really doing anything. Like, listen, I love being cute, right? <laughs> <laughs> we know this. I, I love a bad pun, but it doesn't mean that it belongs in the abstract. It's not doing anything for the abstract. Um, so, you know, stuff that you're trying to be playful with the tone um, really shouldn't come at the expense of like having good solid uh, meat, <laughs> as it were, or tofu, I guess, on the on the plate. <laughs> you want to have your main course before you can get to, to any of the the fun. Um, and I say, you know, the music can't play samples of lutes or capture the voices of the troubadours, but it is still able to capture some of the energy and fun of a medieval dance, including some of the limitations of instrumentation. It's almost an argument, but it doesn't end up really saying anything. Um, so this is me trying to write a terrible last sentence, very awkward phrasing and flow. It's trying to suggest something about texture, but it manages to kind of insult uh, early music. <laughs> <laughs> or show that I don't really know what I'm talking about, where I, t I talk about the limitations found in earlier forms of musical style. <laughs> like, what What am I saying here? Um, I also, and this is subtle, uh, if the word count is 250, this was two, I made this 267 words. So going slightly over, 
um, is risky. A word or two might escape notice, um, but some folks, it's going to display for them on the bottom of the, you know, if you're they're opening it in Word, um, there's the thing right at the bottom. And if you see that the overall word count looks like kind of far beyond the 250, you might then highlight just the, the abstract and go, oh, they went over by, you know, quite a bit here. Um, so some folks aren't going to bother to run it through the word count and just look at the content. If, but if it is very over or under, that does that does catch notice. Um, and it, it can, for some people, be kind of an auto elimination um, for failing to follow the brief. So this is why I, I get so, like big on the like you can eliminate one word here you know here it, like that very nitpicky one word at a time kind of elimination because I like to be right on the money <laughs> or like you know just just under um I, I often have almost every abstract I have been exactly whatever the word count is and I find a way to make that work all right now we have one that is less bad Again, I try to make that one like realistically bad. <laughs> this next one is better, but not not great. So I think this can be not yeah. So like Pete says, not a stickler for a little over or under. And again, it, that alone isn't going to be the. Th there's a combination of factors whenever something isn't accepted for me. There's very few things that are like an instant no. One of them might be if you're dealing with a sensitive topic and you're doing it really irresponsibly. And like, I have no confidence that you're, you're going to do it well. But other than that, again, it's just like we said with the formatting, you don't want things to be distracting. Um, when it's noticeable, it raises, it can raise red flags. And this includes being too far under the word count. Um, that sometimes is a little bit weird. <laughs> uh, where you're just like, you had space and you weren't taking advantage of it. Um, yeah, when it's when it's noticeable, that raises flags. Um, so yeah, again, being a couple words here, but being being you know decently over where it's like three hundred words or five hundred, you know, it's way over and it's very noticeable. Um, it can also read like, oh, you submitted this to a different conference and then you didn't you didn't adapt it. <laughs> that can be a problem too. Like maybe you have a 150 word abstract and that's great, but like now you have 250 for this conference and then you just submit the original again. Like I like to see stuff kind of evolve um, and be sort of tailored to the, the folks that you know are going to be reading it. All right. Here's the second one where I have tried to improve things a little bit, but it's not great. And there's still things we can improve. All right. Adaptation is a growing area of interest in media studies, looking at how a work transforms across mediums and contexts. In this paper, I plan to explore Paul Webb's score for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, 1991, which greatly differs from the Michael Kamen score for the film of the same name, and how it suggests Renaissance roots rather than fully orchestrated epic film scoring. In the game, Webb's score sounds as though it's derived from Renaissance dance music, which is an unexpectedly anachronistic choice in a game set in the medieval era. It is possible that Webb felt that true medieval music, such as unmetered monophonic Gregorian chant, was a poor fit to encode in assembly language on the NES. The NES may not have been able to play samples of hurdy-gurdies or capture the voices of the troubadours for our game ears, I guess I held on to that pun, but it is still able to imply stylistic markers of early music through the use of ground or lament bass, it repeats that we might find in early dance forms that show up as loops, and through the sound channels imitating three-voice polyphonic textures. Webb's use of the triangle channel is also striking, demonstrating his deep knowledge of the sound chip's capabilities. In this paper, I will compare the game score to the film score, compare the game score to actual Renaissance polyphony, and show how Webb deftly utilized the capabilities of the NES sound chip to create an arresting accompaniment to archery and adventure. Cool. That one's actually, like, not horrible, right? I tried to make this, again, realistically, <laughs> something that somebody could conceivably put out there into the world. So here we have a slightly expanded opening. We lose the epigraph. Still has a bit of redundancy um, where I talk about how adaptation is a growing area of interest in media studies, looking at how the work transforms across mediums. So media studies mediums. I could leave that, but it could be better. It's not really a hook yet. It's not really saying anything about adaptation, just that people study it again. It's just a little bit better. <laughs> I still have in my second sentence, in this paper, I plan to explore. It's still that I plan to do X. 
This isn't too bad because at least I'm starting to show here that I've interacted with both the game and the film and that I know some of the differences, but it's it's not really an argument yet. It's just pointing out that they sound different, um, saying um, Renaissance roots rather than fully orchestrated epic film scoring. Like, yeah, that's a start. The seed of my eventual argument is in, in this next thing. I say in the game, web score sounds as though it's derived from Renaissance dance music, which is an unexpectedly anachronistic choice in a game set in the medieval era. So, right, and this actually happened early in my research process, not, not, it wasn't something that came out in the process of doing the analysis. I, I remember thinking this sounds like Renaissance dance music, like right when I heard it, just because I, I like early music. So there were pieces of it that were like really interesting to me. And then I was like, wait, this game's medieval. <laughs> like it was, it was instantaneous. This is the seed of an argument where uh, I recognize that I have to contend with the anachronism instead of just ignoring it. Um, in the actual version, that was like a central piece of it. And then uh, the next sentence, I try to kind of come up with why. I have a plausible guess here. It's possible that Webb felt that true medieval music, such as unmetered monophonic Gregorian chant, was a poor fit to encode an assembly language on the NES. It's a plausible guess for something I wasn't able to find any interviews about with Webb specifically on the music. I did find reviews of the game, but there was nothing focusing on the music and how it differed from the film that it, in the process of research. So pretty much all those things came from my own work. And so the funny thing was after um, I wrote the abstract, uh, I was actually able to track down Webb and interview him. So I was able to ans ask all my questions, learn about his love of Thomas Tallis, very deep love of Thomas Tallis. And then I confirmed some of the things I was working on, which shaped the resultant paper. Um, but you can, you can see, I like, I definitely have some ideas about why things wouldn't have worked. And he did confirm like, yeah, Gregorian chant wouldn't have, wouldn't have worked as well. Like the, it, he wanted to do different things and kind of go with his, his love and his strengths. Um, in the end of the sentence, I talk about encoding in the assembly language on the NES. I feel like I'm taking a little bit of a chance there by not defining assembly language. So again, if I were proposing this talk for a non-ludomusicology audience, I might need to explain that because that, that's going to be more like jargon. Um, or I could just, you know, leave it out and say, was a poor fit to encode <laughs> on the NES sound chip or something. You know, there's ways around um, even using that term if I, if I didn't think I could get into it. Then I, I, again, have a similar sentence to what I had in the previous one about the NES may not have been able to play samples of hurdy-gurdies or capture the voices of the troubadours, again, for game ears. Um, really nicely specific that I say hurdy-gurdy, but, like, how often, how often does anybody make hurdy-gurdy plural? Like, <laughs> it's just weird. Um, it, 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 again, it's like, do I have to give, like... Do I have to give a specific example here? Like, what is this doing here? <laughs> could I could I be like a little bit more compact in my language here? I also it, clearly I'm trying to make fetch happen with this pun, this game ears pun. Um, it's a little more natural here than it was in the past one, but it's still not great. Um, I again only made this up for this workshop as I was trying to write the progressively worse versions, um, but it would have have to be used well to stay in the final version. I think some of this, these things are best used later on. Um, it's also, if I were going to use it in a actual presentation, I'd want it to be a visual as well, like on the PowerPoint uh, to drive home the fact that it's a pun on gamer. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think that's clear. It's not the best, but clearly I was attached to it. it like the, the, the fictional persona that I invented of me was attached to this. <laughs> But I do, to the credit of this one, get into some specific ways that Webb's score implies the Renaissance. I talk about the use of ground lament bass, um, some of the looping kind of, it, I, I'm implying that there are kind of like binary dance form, um, like structural repeats um, that get mapped onto how he, how he structures his loops, um, and then sound channels imitating three voice polyphonic textures. Very cool. So I, I am getting to some things. Um, the next one I have kind of a, uh, again, a more subtle issue with it. So I have a list. Webb's use of the triangle channel is also striking, demonstrating his deep knowledge of the sound. Wait, is that one? It's the previous sentence still. Hold on. Ah, okay. Sorry. Uh, I, ha I start to make a list in this sentence through the, uh, about how we imply the stylistic markers of early music. Through the use of ground or lament bass, 
repeats that we might find in early dance forms that show up as loops and through the sound channels imitating three voice polyphonic textures. So when you're making a list of several elements, try to aim for parallelism through the use of X, Y, Z, you know, X comma Y comma Z, or through the use of X, the use of Y, the use of Z. Here, I only did it the through the in the first and last. I did through the use of X comma Y comma and through the Z which is really not an optimal flow. It just, it like doesn't read as well. So try to keep things like, again, parallel in your form. Um, and th that's where reading it out loud catches. It, it doesn't like completely not work, but it's, it's just, it's not as compact as it could be. It's a little more awkward. <clears throat> and then in the next sentence, Webb's use of the triangle channel is also striking, demonstrating his deep knowledge of the sound chip's capabilities. Note that I don't say how the triangle channel use is striking, uh, so I could probably trim a bit elsewhere to give myself the space to explain that. And then at the end, I do try to give a nice summative statement of the purpose and introduce a little style into the form of alliteration about accompaniment, arresting accompaniment to archery and adventure, which I actually don't hate. I'm cool with that. Um, perhaps a bit much to have four row words in a row that start with a, but like, I don't hate it <laughs> and I wouldn't hate seeing it. Um, so I do have, I do have like a way to try to sum it up and kind of give a rationale at the end. So like, this isn't the worst. It's got some things, but I can absolutely see this coming in. And, um, you know, if I was lucky, i it might get in, but as we can see, there are things I can still tighten up. So finally the last one this is the version that was actually accepted i'm not saying it's perfect but it is the one that was accepted so it's kind of what we're using as, a, as the benchmark that i unwrote from so i actually didn't just have paul webb's score for robin hood prince of thieves the actual title has the alliteration on adaptation airs and assembly language paul webb's score for robin hood prince of thieves one common assumption about adaptation is that it is a dilution, a paler copy of an experience. Yet Paul Webb's score for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, 1991, bears no resemblance to Michael Kamen's lushly orchestrated film score. Though Webb's material is original, its textures and voice leading suggest Renaissance roots, anachronistic for the context of the Crusades, but alluding to Elizabethan airs and instrumental dances in a way that echoes the identification of Robin Hood with England. As Karen Cook's work on Civilization IV and Chant and Games has shown, implying the Middle Ages in the little musical context is often about constructing a version of the past that sounds the way people think it may have sounded, rather than striving for historical accuracy. Beyond these tendencies to collapse the distant past musically for aesthetic ends, certain technical considerations make Renaissance music better suited to the NES. Ground or lament bass lines are easily looped. Meters are regular and thus easier to encode, rather than free, as in Gregorian chant. And the limited number of sound channels on the console are more conducive to textures found in Renaissance polyphony. However, what is most striking in the score is Webb's innovative use of the timbral possibilities of the triangle channel to imply unpitched percussion, despite apparent harmonic clashing with the upper voices. This belies his deep knowledge of the sound chip's capabilities. Webb's score not only recognizes resonances. In translating errors into assembly language, he created something remarkably idiomatic for the NES. There it is. So that was the final version. So, you note my opening sentence. Again, I'm talking about adaptation. I still don't give a citation here because adaptation literature is big. But I'm finally saying something about adaptation instead of just acknowledging that a discourse does exist around it. This makes a claim that hopefully piques the reader's interest to keep reading. Like, oh, the idea that like the adaptation is somehow worse than the original. That's interesting. I do still have um, repetition in the second sentence of the word score. I say Paul Webb's score for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves bears no resemblance to Michael Kamen's lushly orchestrated film score. But it's a, it's a little hard to avoid in this case without making things clunkier or more convoluted. So just trying to vary the prose and the sort of sentence structure makes it sound a little better when read aloud. So like score, score doesn't like jump out to me as being really redundant. And again, there are words like music or game that you're gonna, you're gonna have a hard time not using. Um, but especially when it's within the same sentence, just like read it out loud and see how it sounds. Um, and if it works, it works, but it, it can sometimes be kind of clunky. All right. And then 
uh, the next one, you know, I mentioned the Renaissance roots, uh, alluding to Elizabethan airs and instrumental dances in a way that echoes the identification of Robin Hood with England. So here I actually make an argument about why Renaissance music still works for a game set in England uh, in the Middle Ages. So instead, and I'm not just pointing out the anachronism, I'm sort of suggesting like a productive um, result. Um, of this usage, which is kind of more in line with medievalist work in general, is like we're not so interested in pointing out what's correct or incorrect because in the end that's cool, you've done that. That's not very interesting. <laughs> um, but the, there is something to be said here that there 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 is an oral connection we can make. I then, of course, situate my work against another Ludo scholar, Karen Cook, on, on Civilization V and Chant. Um, you know, and I don't put the years or I could have just put the years um, to save a few words, but I wanted to kind of specify that I, you know, what I'm thinking of here in terms of she talks about like civilization four and kind of constructing like historical uh, eras in, in that in that series and then chant, of course. Um, so then that shows like, yeah, I've read some stuff that relates. I do tighten up some of my examples in the second paragraph start to make a second argument about not just adaptation, but about the NES and Renaissance textures specifically. And so I talk about all the features of his music um, that end up um, making Renaissance music really well suited to the capabilities of the NES. You'll note that I, instead of just saying that Paul Webb has an innovative use of the triangle channel, I, I say what he does with it. Because when I did the transcriptions, I was really surprised um, when I then looked at them, they're like, oh, the triangle channel is, is pitched. And like, it's, it's in a way that should be clashing with the, the harmony of the upper voices, but it wasn't. Um, so being able to say specifically, like he's, he knows the, the temporal possibilities of that channel in order to make sure that like, it gets a, it gets a really good sound without actually sounding like a clash in a way he didn't want it to. So I say specifically what it is. I give it away. And then I conclude with a thesis about how the music is idiomatic for the NES um, due to his prowess as a programmer. So, cool stuff. Cool story, bro. <laughs> so, um, I hope that this was kind of an interesting look into the components in an abstract, the things I certainly like to see. Um, we got some examples from some, some friends friends of the channel here um, with a, their really excellent abstracts where I could kind of point to what works in those, but then, you know, taking one of my own abstracts and just like ripping it up and, and seeing what we could create out of that, um, I think can be really useful because a lot of the work of writing a good abstract is sort of having a draft version and then working through it, you know, taking, doing the editing, cutting out words, like word by word sometimes, thinking through just like the strategy of it like what is this doing you know do I need this in the abstract versus in the paper itself what are the what are the most direct ways to convey what I'm trying to convey to give the the committee as much information as possible to give them a sense um, that I've done my homework you know I have the background I have some context I'm situating I know how my work fits in um, and that, uh, you know, ultimately I have something interesting to say. Uh, it's not like you necessarily have to make an argument, but I do think a lot of, a lot of effective work has something to say and, um, making sure that we have a sense of, you know, what that is and that we don't, don't save it for the paper again. <laughs> you might not get the chance. Um, hopefully this was, was a useful thing and I will, um, I will be around if anybody wants to contact me directly, you know, via Twitter or, or wherever. Um, I am serving as head of the program committee this year. Um, and so I will not be voting in the same way <laughs> on the abstracts because I will be compiling all of them. So I will see who is who and um, kind of separating that info out and then sending the anonymous versions on to the committee and kind of compiling their responses and organizing them. So because of that, um, if, you, if you have specific questions and, and want to ask me about it, feel free to reach out um, because I, I will not be submitting like rankings 
likely <laughs> at all. I might weigh weigh in uh, as to you know e- even knowing who it is, like uh, just being able to look at the the con- if, like if, if it came down to folks arguing about one, I I might say like I I think this one's really strong or whatever. But for the most part, I wanted to make sure that it was, uh, you know, I'll just be on the uh, on the admin side of things. So feel free to reach out, um, not only to me but to other scholars if you haven't done a lot of this yet it can be really useful to find someone that's like an abstract is such a quick read um that's that's a very easy ask for somebody um where you can just be like you know hey i'm looking at submitting this to a conference like does it read okay like is there anything that like you think is missing or that it needs um that can be a really nice really nice thing to kind of expand your network a little bit um and as and get a little little practice doing but yeah if anybody has any questions on abstract writing in general, um, let me know. I'm so glad that, that folks were able to tune in and hopefully find this useful. This bottle obviously just stay up as it does on my channel. It won't it won't get copyright struck because I played no music or no copyrighted material. So <laughs> uh, it was just very talky. Um, but yeah, uh, deadline for the North American Conference on Video Game Music is October 15th. And the email address is just knackfagum at gmail.com, if I recall. And let me just link the, the actual conference info, the call for presentations that contains everything we're looking for. Um, so it kind of, it suggests different areas of proposals, you know, th- different types of things you could be looking at. Uh, it has the dates of the conference, which are February 4th and 5th, 2023. The deadline is October 15th, 2022. The venue is Stetson University in Florida with with our lovely host, Pete Smucker. Um, but we will have a virtual hybrid component. Um, so there there will be, will, will be options for attendance and everything, um, as, as well as like pre-recorded uh, videos and things and you have an option when you submit to indicate um if you would prefer a 20 minute talk with 10 minutes for discussion or a a 10 minute uh lightning talk 10 minute talk with five minutes for discussion and you can deliver either as live or pre-recorded video um so you can indicate that to to me (laughs) in the email uh to the knackfagum at gmail.com and uh, in the body of the email, you can include your name, institutional affiliation, if, if applicable or if desired, <laughs> contact information, title of the paper. You can optionally choose to identify yourself as a current undergraduate or graduate student or a member of the game audio industry and the metadata that can be that can be really useful. Um, you know, if we consider maybe doing like a student panel or something like we, we can sort of make sure that we group things properly um, and uh, we we don't have anything necessarily like earmarked or set aside at the moment to do that. But if we if we had a lot of folks say like yeah I'm I'm currently a student, um, we may consider doing like a student panel specifically to kind of put that work together. Um, so could be could be useful to have have that kind of info in there. Um, Two fifty words is what we decided on for the proposals. Um, uh, yeah, and then the proposals themselves should include the title of the paper, but otherwise no identifying information. Again, put that in the email, not in the actual document or PDF or whatever that you upload. Um, please provide trigger warnings if your if your talk contains that type of material uh, or content warnings. And other than that, if anybody has any questions, you can reach me at Musicologist on Twitter. It's probably the the most immediate way. Um, if you would like to perform as opposed to talk, there's also a recital that we're doing, uh, which will take place on February 4th. And it also will involve virtual and pre-recorded elements. Uh, It's about a five to seven minute total performance of game audio or game inspired music. And that has separate criteria listed on the call for presentations page if you scroll down. Um, And so if you are interested in performing, you can do that as well. Uh, I've done it in previous years and it's a good time. Yeah, recital of game music. It's a wonderful time. We had a we had a brilliant one. Actually, our being online, we decided to do an online one, and it was it was awesome and uh, so much fun. So, I I would likely if I do this end up doing a pre recorded because I do I do like smooth McGroove style multi tracking, but nowhere near as good as him. So, <laughs> I would probably do another multi track if I do this. But 
Anyway, I think that's everything. So if nobody has any questions, I hope you all enjoy your Friday and your weekend. And best of luck getting these conference proposals put together and edited down and as effective as can be. Can't wait to, to see what y'all come up with. Happy Friday. See, join us next week where we will be uh, having on the wonderful Elizabeth Medina Gray yet again um, because I, I needed to talk about her chapter on flower. And so we will be looking at that wonderful publication uh, on the Kudo Musicology stream. See you next week. Bye.